so today's talk uh, is on proximal junctional kyphosis and proximal junctional failure. Uh, and um, I, uh, the reason I chose to talk about this is we've really not got this figured out yet. And so this is, uh, in essence, a conversation. I'll start the conversation by a presentation over the next 15 or 20 minutes about where we're at. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, maybe continue if we have any time left uh, after that uh, together. Uh, disclosures are not uh, directly related to anything I'm going to talk about today. But as you can see, I've done a little bit with uh, industry. Most of it is old. And I will not be discussing implants, per se. Uh, and so uh, moving forward, I'm going to present a case that kind of illustrates the issue, and then talk about where we are in the literature, and 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 then near the end, just give you some thoughts on avoidance, <clears throat> just uh, from my experience and views, and and those around me. <clears throat> Excuse me, and open uh, a discussion. <clears throat> so, a 59-year-old woman um, presents with a prior history of L5, L45 laminectomy. Uh, with recurrent spinal stenosis and spondylolisthesis, and these are her uh, CT myelograms uh, obtained in an outside facility and, and clearly has enough going on that, uh, and she's failed non-operative management and will plan to proceed with uh, surgical intervention. And she'd actually had uh, this done uh, by someone else, but it, to me, looks fine. There's a bit of a degenerative scoliosis that, uh, that was managed uh, with uh, fusion and uh, stabilization. She had anterior and posterior at that time. The anterior cage kicked forward, it looks like, a little bit to me at the 3-4 level, but uh, otherwise remained stable and went on to fuse. And she did relatively well for, for quite some time and then developed adjacent segment degeneration with recurrent stenosis. And so uh, this was quite debilitating for her, and so we ended up going one level higher with this, just as a laminectomy and posterior fusion adjacent to the prior. And again, she did quite well. She's now 61, did quite well for some time, and then developed uh, this proximal junctional failure with screws pulling out uh, and stenosis above again. So in light of that, we took her up to T11 or T10. So she now had a T10 to a sacrum fusion. You can see she's a little forward. She's a little sagittally imbalanced, but not bad. And for her age, it's probably quite reasonable. Um, and she did well for. Uh, a period of time and then developed, again, proximal junctional failure. And so in light of this recurrent theme, I'm going to go back and review some of the literature. But let's start with the definition of proximal junctional kyphosis. It's uh, technically a greater than 10 degree change uh, from uh, the upper segment, the upper instrumented vertebra, vertebral body, to two levels above that. Uh, a change of more than 10 degrees over time. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and really came to the forefront uh, from uh, several papers out of Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, and uh, this is one of them, uh, 81 consecutive patients uh, with spinal deformity, uh, uh, average five-year follow-up. And they were, uh, they were looking for this problem and how to uh, diagnose it and manage it, and noted a 26% incidence. Now, these are many of these are adult scoliosis patients that went up into the upper thoracic spine, and they said, well, one of the risk factors is a upper instrument of vertebra, UIV, uh, that stops at T3. Uh, and, um, and also, many of them had hooks at the top, and they seemed to fail more when there were hooks at the top. OK, so that's where we started. Actually, one more piece of information, interesting. It didn't really change their outcome scores. So we noticed that there was a change of 10 or more degrees, but it didn't change their outcome scores. So it was more of a commentary on this issue, not one that necessarily needed to be treated. And uh, another paper out of the same group uh, with a little bit longer follow-up is minimum five-year follow-up really started to display what the risk factors were, a risk factor of age, probably also osteoporosis. So age greater than 55 was kind of set as a as a floor for uh, age for potential increase in risk, as well as fusions that included the sacrum were two in particular um, highly noted issues. Incidence is a little higher now, about 40%. So it's now varying between about 20, 20, 20% and 40%. Uh, interestingly, also, because this is, again, this is relatively new at this point. We're talking about the mid-2000s um, when this study was done, uh, published a little after that. But about 60% of these occurred within the first eight weeks after surgery. So it's an early phenomenon for many patients. Again, didn't really seem to change the outcome scores unless the kyphosis was pretty large. Uh, 
And then this paper started to, this paper, uh, Yagi and another paper that will follow immediately, really started to change our thinking on proximal junctional kyphosis. Again, incidence somewhere in the neighborhood of 2% or 20%, uh, but revisions were not that common and outcome stories didn't seem to change. But not only was it age now, infusion to the sacrum, but global sagittal malalignment, so, so uh, uh, a forward posture, seemed to increase the risk. And that's become a more common theme, as you'll see in the next few minutes. But the other thing that Yagi started on this uh, discussion was that there are different kinds of proximal junctional failure. And the most common one is this ligamentous, what he termed ligamentous, really is a non-bony change in kyphotic deformity of greater than 10 degrees at the proximal end of a construct that was largely a radiographic finding, that was largely asymptomatic, and that largely didn't change patients report outcome scores versus uh, osseous or implant failure as a cause, so either fracture or implant failure or both, which often was symptomatic and often needed revision. He also added a grading scheme that seemed to be relatively mild if it was under 15 degrees and quite severe if it was over 20 degrees, and that helped define who might become symptomatic. And so now we're starting to think, well, maybe it's not just kyphosis, but sort of kyphosis in the realm of failure that's the issue. Uh, and they talk about this uh, in related, uh, relation to this paper again, where uh, most of them occur within the first three months, most of them in patients that are osteopenic, and uh, a significant higher change, uh, in, or higher ODI score, which is a change in the outcome score, when the patient is, has a symptomatic proximal junctional kyphosis. So it's no longer just a benign, oh, we can see it on x-ray. And there are two kinds, in essence, two kinds of fractures or failure that we see that are related to implant failure or fracture. And one is uh, simply that the superior vertebrae kyphosis or uh, collapses into a compression fracture with some kyphosis. And the more concerning one, actually, is when you see collapse of the upper instrument of vertebrae with subluxation of the vertebrae above, and we see a high risk of myelopathy or neurologic injury related to this. Uh, both of these are seen more commonly when the BMI is, is high. Um, and that led to this concept, should we really, especially at our institution, should we really be talking about proximal junctional kyphosis, or should we be talking about something more demonstrative than that? Because the radiographic kyphosis by itself, you know, it's common, 20 to 40%. It occurs early. Risk factors, as I've outlined, but not always symptomatic. And yet, those that are symptomatic have really had fracture or failure. And so that, coin, that, that sort of led to the, a change in the terminology, uh, both at our place and then uh, amongst the, the investigators in the ISSG, International Spine Study Group, which does a lot of deformity and has a lot of podium time at the Scoliosis Research Society. Now they seem to have 10 or plus papers uh, every year. Um, and so I'll be quoting some of the ISSG papers. But uh, this idea of proximal junctional failure really kind of took off at that point instead of just proximal junctional kyphosis. And so the definition of proximal junctional failure is a kyphosis of greater than 15 degrees. That's actually still relatively soft for a failure mode. It's hard to get excited about failure when the patient's asymptomatic or many of most of the patients are asymptomatic. And so it really focused on this idea that there is a fracture or implant failure at the upper instrument of vertebrae or the one right above it, and that those may uh, be associated with myelopathy or we may see myelopathy, in fact, without either of those. So myelopathy separately is added to that. And this is the paper uh, Hostin's the senior, uh, the ch uh, first author on uh, from ISSG that really outlined proximal junctional failure, and in this case, acute proximal junctional failure as the thing we now talk about rather than just proximal junctional kyphosis. And they had 1,200 patients. They reviewed their database. And, uh, and their incidence, interestingly, was much lower. But again, this is just the failure group of a subset of the entirety of proximal junctional kyphosis. So a subset has proximal junctional failure that was about 6%. And all occur, almost all of them occurred early. So we, we were interested in this as well. We started seeing a lot of needs for revisions at the top end of a long construct and trying to like figure this out and put a database together. I had a fellow from Greece for several years that um, really helped me uh, get our database together. And uh, this was one of the papers that came out of that. We decided, you know, we want to look just so the, the paper from ISSG included all uh, 
deformity patients, all ages, uh, most of them, many of them younger than 55, and their, their risk is, is low. We know that the risk is much greater in older patients. And so we wanted to look, in our experience told us that we're seeing a lot more failures in older patients as well. We looked at just that greater than 55 year age group, and we had actually 165 patients at this point in our database that were already older than uh, 55, uh, that had a minimum of one year follow up, an average of uh, two and a half year follow up. Uh, and in that group, we wanted to figure out what the incidence uh, and, uh, um, and revision rates were for proximal junctional failure. We're calling it acute proximal junctional failure because they need a revision within the first year after their first surgery. And the incidence is 28%. So 28% of patients had early uh, uh, acute proximal junctional failure. Many of them needed surgery. I'll show you that in a second. Um, Interestingly, most of them occurred in the th in the, uh, when we ended at the thoracolumbar spine, uh, much more so than the upper thoracic spine or the lumbar spine. Uh, most of them were fractures uh, rather than purely implant failures. Many of them had a fracture and implant fa failure. Uh, and uh, again, the revision rate was high. It was 37% of those with proximal junctional failure had revision within a year, which was a upper thoracic, lower thoracic, and lumbar. So upper thoracic is that when we ended, our, so our upper instrument vertebrae was T1 to 5. Lower thoracic essentially was T9 to 12. Lumbar was L1, 2 usually because they're all deformity patients. And upper instrumented vertebrae, sorry to throw the lingo out. Uh, upper instrumented vertebrae is the top vertebrae that's been instrumented. So in the upper instrumented vertebrae is in the Upper thoracic spine, the incidence of failure is, and revision for that failure is much lower than it is when it's in the lower thoracic or lumbar spine. So that kind of had us looking back at literature again, and this is the, probably the most common uh, paper discussed that looks at failure rates by level. And this group, again out of WashU, looked at t just the thoracolumbar spine, so T910, T1011, and uh, T910, T1112, and L12. And prior to this paper coming out, it was fairly strict dogma that you, sh you should not stop your con constructs at L1 or T12. If you had to go to L1, just go to T11. Most people went to T10. Otherwise, you can stop at L2, but you shouldn't stop in between. And this is, there are many papers that discuss this, but probably the most common uh, is out of Asia. Uh, with Sook, um, where they had higher failure rates at right at the thoracolumbar junction of T12, L1. Uh, and so I, I grew up in this era. This paper refuted that and said, in fact, we see just as many failures stopping at any of these levels. Incidence of proximal junctional kyphosis was 50% at T9, 10, T9 or T10. T11 and T12 was the same. L1 and L2 was less, but they had fewer patients in that group and there was no diff difference in revision rate. So now all of a sudden, we don't have to decide to stop at L2 or jump all the way to T10 or, or 11. We could stop anywhere in there and the incidence of failure is just as high, not just as low. So, um, so there's no difference here. This isn't really the solution then. Just having to jump up to T10 by itself doesn't seem to be the solution. We looked back at our group of patients and we tried to, we did a multivariate uh, regression analysis trying to figure out what is the difference between the patients that fail and the ones that don't. Tough to, tough to sort out still. I mean, we did find a couple things which have been uh, shown by others now as well. Uh, and one of them is um, how much you've changed the lordosis. So if these patients are very sagittally imbalanced, you've changed their lordosis a lot. So lumbar lordosis change of greater than 30 degrees, PSO maybe largely patients their risk of falling forward at the top of wherever you end is much higher. And our experience, I was pretty sure that we were gonna find that because I've seen that over and over again now. The other thing is how much, uh, uh, how much of an angle you leave at the top. So proximal junctional angle means how much kyphus there is between the top vertebrae and the ones above it. And if that's, if you leave, uh, if you stop at a point where the next vertebrae up is, uh, is somewhat kyphotic, the risk of failure is much higher. So those two things bore out in a multi-aggression analysis when almost everything else fell, fell out. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to throw this out to the rehab docs, because this has been mentioned in different conferences. But um, you know, the hip flexors, they're neurologically, the brain wants to go flat back and go forward, and then you bring it backwards, and the brain still wants to go forward. So again, not to discuss right this second, but 
One thing we don't really talk about on these flatbacks is preoperative rehab, about stretching out the hips, really working on neurologically reprogramming them before we do the flatback surgery. Perfect, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a whole host of interesting issues to discuss, including um, the other, uh, another related issue. So the hip flexors push people forward. You've got this rigid lordosis you've created, so they have to bend right at the top. All the pressure is right on the very top vertebrae and the one above it, and they break. In addition, there's now some people starting to talk about something called a set point. People you know, have been walking around for years with their head in front of their pelvis. Now you've just made them like this, so they kyf because they're used to their head being that much in front of their pelvis, and this set point takes a long time to change. And so it's a, a separate issue that may be related to this that we're starting to look at as well. So one other issue related to uh, this, uh, we, we st we went, as we were looking through all our papers, all our cases on, in our database, we're like, you know, we were told T10 would be a safe place to stop. And if you polled people nationally, almost everybody just goes to T10. And we're seeing a lot of failures at T10. So we said, let's just look up T10 and, and, and where we stop. And we went T10, T11, T12, what, you know, what the failure rate was like, because T10 is supposed to be so safe. And so we looked at 165 uh, 365 patients over about eight years and uh, 119 proximal junctional failures in that group. So we had 100, uh, this is a good database for proximal, we were really good at creating proximal junctional failure. And um, we had about half of those that we stopped at T10 and T11, T12, and L1 were the other half of our group. So we lumped those as thoracolumbar spine and found that uh, not only do we have a lot of failures at T10, but we had a higher percentage of failures of T10 compared to T11, T12, and L1. And so while the rest of the, group, uh, of the country is saying go to T10 to uh, prevent proximal junctional failure, we're saying, no, we can cause it even at T10. And, um, and so that wasn't really a, a safe zone for us. We did actually look at some detail at postoperatively the patient's radiographic parameters, their deformity parameters. And noted that the group where we stopped at T10 actually might be a little different than the group we stopped at T12 or L1, in that we did more correction in them, we created a better overall lumbar spine pelvic match, and probably put them at higher risk of proximal junctional failure than, than the other group where we were probably just treating a scoliotic deformity and stenosis. So, so as yet, we're, we're still sorting out the differences between uh, between uh, the, the levels, but probably the level is less important than these other issues. One last thing that we wanted to look at, we said, well, why don't we just go all the way to the upper thoracic spine and just forget this issue of proximal junctional failure? So we looked at the difference in those two groups, like just bypass and not even deal with the thoracolumbar spine. And so we had uh, this review where we looked at uh, a little over 200 patients uh, with a, um, a minimum two-year follow-up uh, average of uh, close to four-year follow-up, and split the patient cohort into two groups. One when we stopped the upper thoracic spine, T two, three, four, five. One when we stopped in the at the thoracolumbar junction. Um, the groups were a little bit different radiographically. There was a little bit uh, uh, more sagittal imbalance uh, in the group that uh, we had actually gone up to the upper thoracic spine because we were already knowing that we were having so many problems in sagittal imbalance patients, we tended to go higher on them already. But they weren't that far off, and we could get a good sense of what was going on. Uh, our earlier revision rate, common to what we presented already, about 26% of that group had an early revision. Uh, and it was pretty equal, actually. So going up to the upper thoracic spine hadn't saved us from an early revision, but the cause was different. So we saw hardly any proximal junctional failures in the upper thoracic spine group. In fact, we didn't, I, I, we had like one patient that we, re we had to revise for proximal junctional failure in the upper thoracic group. But we saw a lot more pseudoarthrosis in that group. So we added all those levels of fusion and had a higher rate of pseudoarthrosis with a rod fracture and, and need for revision surgery. Uh, so the revision rate's the same, but it was for a different cause. The overall, that was early revision, the overall revision rate likewise was the same, again, for a different cause. In the upper thrust group, it was for pseudoarthrosis. And we used BMP, but we didn't use as much as Wash U uses. We didn't have enough BMP in the state of Utah to use as much as Wash U uses. Uh, but, um, but we, uh, 
we probably could have managed pseudoarthrosis better had we used more. We tended to use two large packs of BMP and a big thoracolumbar fusion and, and one in a shorter. We probably use a little bit more now. But that said, it's a biologic problem when we go to the top. It's a mechanical problem when we stop in the thoracolumbar spine. But wouldn't you say revising a pseudo is a lot easier than revising a PJK? Uh, I would, the, uh, yes, I, I, yes. I mean, because yes. you don't have to extend the fusion and you're simply repairing, replacing rods and bone graft, correct? Right. So I mean, as far as the long-term patient outcome, it seems like you'd still be better off repairing a pseudo. Yes, there are two issues. One is it's a little easier to revise a pseudo, especially because if the rod's fracture, it's an easy fix. Uh, secondly, the risk of, of a neurologic injury, which is to me even the more worrisome thing, is much higher in a proximal junctional failure patient than in a pseudoarthrosis patient. So there's two reasons to potentially think that if we want to choose which failure to have, I might choose the non-union failure. This is just a quick look at the survival analysis over two years, uh, which is no different, no difference between the upper and lower thoracics over five years uh, and longer than five years. So um, one more illustrative case, and you can kind of see how I approach proximal junctional failure uh, treatment. This is a 74-year-old woman with uh, L1-2, L4-5 non-unions and severe low back pain uh, and an obvious kyphus uh, at uh, the upper lumbar spine. Uh, these are her parameters, and I'll jump past that right now. Uh, her CT myelogram, and we can see uh, what her risk factor for proximal junctional failure is. She has many of them. Her age is 74, her osteoporosis, her fusion to S1, uh, and a global sagittal malalignment. Uh, uh, so we're trying to choose a level that does not have kyphus, so we're going to stop in that area where the proximal junctional angle PJA is, is zero degrees, so we did. Uh, and this is what she looks like, and we, she has a gentle thoracic kyphosis above that. This is uh, quite good. We're quite proud of ourselves on postoperative day one, but by six weeks, we weren't so proud of ourselves again. Uh, so six weeks out, she's got this angle of 37 degrees, so she's changed by 30 degrees now. That's at T10. And here she is at nine months, quite symptomatic, not myelopathic, but just quite symptomatic from her kyphosis. So, uh, and now 50 plus degrees. So we approach, this is how I approach now a proximal junctional kyphosis. Uh, we um, uh, go up to the upper thoracic spine and then do an inline rod rod connectors, an osteotomy if required, either posterior osteotomy or, or more full, and then these side rods to, uh, to augment that. Um, and she did great for a while and then developed proximal junctional kyphosis again. But Daryl, isn't, time with my isn't there a whole bunch of issues around st between T1 to T3 that you get cervical thoracic junction issues? They're not as common, not nearly as common. Like in our group, it was um, the, the numbers were quite different. But the ones that do happen are quite concerning. So this is one of those. This is a T, I think this is T2 or T3. I've forgotten what level it is now. I guess I could count. So this is at 1, 2. And we took her up into the uh, cervical spine. And now she's done well. She has not yet had another proximal junctional failure uh, after that one, but clearly an ongoing issue. So in the last couple slides, the techniques to decrease proximal junctional failure, all level five evidence from my viewpoint on uh, what we've kind of been learning over the last few years. None of them are going to be surprising to you. Um, don't end the construct in lordosis. I never end the top of my construct lordotic and let the spine kyph over the top. So I'm always starting my kyphosis at the top of my construct and letting it continue into the thoracic spine. Uh, begin or continue the thoracic kyphosis at the top levels. Exactly the same issue. Watch out for a flexible thoracic kyphosis pre-op. So patients often have a comp compensatory hypokyphosis when they're co compensating in every other way as they stand up, especially if they're sagittally imbalanced and they're really trying. They've ro rotated their pelvis into retroversion and they really have a flat thoracic kyphosis and you think you're pretty safe with that PJA, proximal junctional angle measurement, except if they have not a rigid but a very mobile thoracic kyphosis and they're just holding themselves there because they have strong paraspinous muscles, as soon as they let go, they do this. As soon as you create a lordotic lumbar spine, they kype over the top. And so that's a little bit of an issue to, to maintain. And so we're a little bit wary of patients and we're starting to get 
get bending films in the sagittal plane of the thoracic kyphosis and looking at that to help us decide. Don't fully correct to a young adult measurement older patients. They don't need to have a, uh, a sagittal balance that is perfect for a young adult. In fact, they're okay a little bit forward. So I, we undercorrect older adults now. Uh, and don't make an overly rigid construct and by, by that, it, that, that's actually a hard thing to try and figure out what to do with. We don't use cobalt, I'm rethinking the use of chrome cobalt rods, which we'd used for a long, long time. The rods are strong, but they're stiff and they're probably stronger and stiffer than the bone. Um, and uh, we stay as low as possible. Uh, it just gives us more room to revise later. Um, go to the upper thoracic spine and use biologic to decrease nonunion rate. Seems a much more logical uh, uh, way to potentially manage this issue. Um, what's been tried and failed? There's a lot of things out there. I mean, there are papers on almost anything that we collectively have tried that seems exciting at first and then doesn't seem as exciting later. And maybe you all have had better experience with this than me or the folks that I've talked to, but hooks of the proximal and the construct have gone in and out of favor several times. I, I can't remember right now if it's in favor or out of favor because it's gone back and forth so many times. So hooks of the con proximal end of the construct seem the solution when all your failures have been screws at the proximal end of the construct. And screws seem better when all your failures have been hooks at the proximal end of the construct, but it doesn't seem to make as, as big a difference as we'd hoped. Cement in the upper instrument, upper instrument vertebrae and the one above it, some people say it's the best thing since sliced bread. Other people say I've, I fail right through the cement. Uh, spinous process wiring, just wiring the top spinous process or using Mersaline tape around the top several spinous processes. Um, some people are trying, uh, doesn't seem to change the lever arm or the fracture rate. Same thing with spinous process clamps. Dynamic stabilization at the top of the construct. So make a rigid construct and then use non-fusion technology at the top end, uh, fails. Uh, more rigid fixation maybe is the better solution or maybe it's the worst solution. Less rigid fixation maybe is the better solution or maybe it's the worst solution. Uh, again, rethinking uh, which rod type to use. We talked about Mersaline tape. And most recently, maybe MIS at the top of the constructs, you know, going to help because you haven't disrupted as much soft tissue and people seem to be able to fail right through that as well. So this is really an unsolved issue. And, and that's why it's, I think, an interesting discussion to have. Um, uh, the incidence is high, both of proximal junctional kyphosis and proximal junctional failure. Uh, the timing of occurrence is early. Many of them occur in the first uh, eight weeks. They continue to occur afterwards, but many of them early. Uh, proximal junctional failure, uh, kyphosis alone doesn't seem to be that symptomatic, but proximal junctional failure is the thing I think we should be concentrating on. Um, myelopathy is, is a common element of this, unfortunately. Uh, often it's reversible, but not completely as you, as you, obviously depends on many other factors, but catching it early and dealing with it. Um, the thoracolumbar failures commonly are fracture at the upper instrument of vertebrae or the one above it, whereas upper thoracic uh, failures, uh, when they fail, they're often a, a, a non-union. If it's PJF, uh, proximal gestational failure at the upper thoracic spine, it's often accompanied by a spondylolisthesis and myelopathy. And lastly, it, it recognize that these risk factors, some of them non-modifiable, such as an age greater than 55, uh, or the fact that we might need to fuse to, to the pelvis, all, all create an increased risk for this, as well as sagittal imbalance. Prevention, we should be talking about it and working on this, and this is sort of the biggest, in my view, the biggest unsolved problem in spinal deformity surgery. Thank you. Mm -hmm.